Malachi chapter 1 This is the message that the Lord gave to Israel through the prophet Malachi. The Lord's love for Israel. I have always loved you, says the Lord. But you retort, really? How have you loved us? And the Lord replies, this is how I showed my love for you. I loved your ancestor Jacob, but I rejected his brother Esau and devastated his hill country. I turned Esau's inheritance into a desert for jackals. Esau's descendants in Edom may say, We have been shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. But the Lord of Heaven's armies replies, They may try to rebuild, but I will demolish them again. Their country will be known as the land of wickedness, and their people will be called the people with whom the Lord is forever angry. When you see the destruction for yourselves, you will say, Truly, the Lord's greatness reaches far beyond Israel's borders. Unworthy sacrifices. The Lord of Heaven's army says to the priests, A son honors his father, and a servant respects his master. If I am your father and master, where are the honor and respect I deserve? You have shown contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we ever shown contempt for your name? You have shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. Then you ask, how have we defiled the sacrifices? You defile them by saying the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. When you give blind animals as sacrifices, isn't that wrong? And isn't it wrong to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? Try giving gifts like that to your governor and see how pleased he is, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. Go ahead, beg God to be merciful to you. But when you bring that kind of offering, why should he show you any favor at all, asks the Lord of Heaven's armies. How I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that these worthless sacrifices could not be offered. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, and I will not accept your offerings. But my name is honored by people of other nations from morning till night. All around the world they offer sweet incense and pure offerings in honor of my name. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. But you dishonor my name with your actions. By bringing contemptible food, you are saying it's all right to defile the Lord's table. You say it's too hard to serve the Lord, and you turn up your noses at my commands, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. Think of it, animals that are stolen and crippled and sick are being presented as offerings. Should I accept from you such offerings as these, asks the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who promises to give a fine ram from his flock, but then sacrifices a defective one to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of heaven's armies, and my name is feared among the nations. share my testimony. Um, in 2012, my mom and I moved here from Mississippi, um, 2012 of July. And three months later, she was diagnosed with cancer. And I was so in denial about it, you know, just in denial. I didn't want to believe it. Me and my mom been through so much ups and downs, ups and downs. At the times, I just wanted to do what I wanted to do on my own. I didn't want to listen. I was hard-headed. Um, but at the end of the day, we loved each other as we should. Um, at the time of her death, I was just so lost, lonely, just about to give up. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to turn to. But somewhere deep down in my heart, God was right there. He was there through the whole thing, through it all. 
And I love him for that. I love him. He could have gave up on me. At times, I still deal with it roughly at times with my mom dying and everything, but God is here, and I know he's going to do amazing things with my life, in my life. He's going to take me places I've never been. He's going to show me things I've never seen. And I'm ready. I'm so ready for it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And with my mom's death, God saved me. I could have been dead. I could have been on drugs, drinking, partying. But God saved me before those things ever came on me. He saved me from depression. He saved me from sadness. He gave me peace. And I want to sing this song to thank him. I already, I already thank him, but I just want to sing. <laughs> thank you, him. When he moves, I'm going to move. If he doesn't move, I'm not moving. That's just it. <laughs> Thank you, Hall.
one spy. They told their lies, but God, my character, my integrity, my faith in God, He faithful will not, will not bend, won't compromise, cause God. Speak like and post the yeah.
to your feet as we receive our pastor this morning. We know as God people believe it and receive it. Stand on it and say God favors. Yes. Miss Bonita, don't you grow weary and well doing. Even in your darkest hour, he will bring forth strength and supply your every need. Keep the faith. Stand strong. Steadfast and unmovable in say. Oh, I thank you, Lord, because I know you. put your hand on yourself and say God favors me in the Lord just good anyhow come on in come on somebody ought to bless the Lord right now oh my God uh, I was thank you Jesus I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to stay focused this morning, but uh, amen. God is just good anyhow. Somebody ought to bless the Lord anyhow. Come on, somebody ought to just praise him. If, if you love him, say his name somebody come on bless the Lord God favors me thank you Jesus thank you Jesus hallelujah we get ready to go into the word of the Lord draw me nearer nearer blessed Lord to the cross separate accidents, Sister Johnny May and Sister Cheryl Crabtree. And let's remember them both in our prayers. Father, touch them, strengthen them. Thank you for how you've taken care of them. You know, God, you, whatever pain or misery, whatever they may be going through right now, hold them in your hand in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As you take your seats, say it with me. Draw
God bless all of you. What a delight again is to see all of you and to have you. We had already acknowledged our guest earlier. But I, think I saw the daughters of this house come in, Jackie and Pierre. Yes, good to see you today. Amen. Amen. God bless you. To all of you that are in the house of the Lord. Now, Last week, Elder Patrick brought a compelling message reminding us of the sacred portion. And he told us we need to take that which is sacred, get it out of our house, and bring it to the place where the Lord has chosen to place his name. And I don't want to re preach that, but. It's groundwork that I want to build on. Amen? Uh, I, I want to say that uh, money is one of the most talked about subjects in the Bible. It's very much a part of the teachings of Jesus. The way we earn it, the way we spend it, the way we give it. Why was it such an issue? I want to submit because there's no other aspect of behavior that says more about our values than how we acquire and manage and uh, the money that comes in our hands. M money is a good barometer of true spirituality. Just let that settle in for a moment. I'm going to say that again. Money is a good barometer, a good barometer of true spirituality. In um, the text we had a couple of weeks ago where the words of Jesus reminded us to lay not up for ourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust thus corrupt and where thieves break through and steal but Jesus said lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor uh, rust does not corrupt nor thieves steal and then he says where your treasure is there your heart will be also uh, it didn't say um, amen where your heart is, you'll find a treasure there. He says, where your treasure is. If you had uh, $20,000 right now on the stock market, then your heart is going to be on the stock market. You ain't going to have many days pass by that you don't take a peek. Or think about how the market is moving. Because if your treasure is there, your heart's going to be there. He said, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be. Now, it's easy to say that the Lord is, God is the Lord of our lives. And, but uh, that never really becomes completely true until he becomes also Lord of our finances. Let me, let me hasten and say that this church has made, I believe, over the last 26 years, indelible impact on this community. Oh, y'all could say something. I say I believe the church has made an impact on this community. And it's also been sustained over these years, over 26 years. Soon, next month actually it'll be 27 years um, that this little body from the storefront and from the possum days, from the possum house, has been sustained. And it is because there, God has, throughout its history, graced it with people who have systematically honored God with their tithes and their offerings. Many have given, and many of you continue to give even far beyond 
your tithe. And I want to say I thank God for you. I thank God for you. Now, however, despite all of the teachings and, and, and uh, one, and don't, don't get nervous, you know, they'll say, oh, Lord, why did I have to come today? Why did, what, what, what did we have to hear another message? Just, just stay with me a little while. I think you'll be all right. Amen. Um, despite all of our teaching and all of the preaching that I've done and others have done and all that has been said and heard, there are those who still struggle with systematically giving to God. And I read an article this week that noted five reasons why people don't tithe. And there's a lot of articles out there that would have nine reasons or ten reasons or whatever, but this particular one gave five reasons, and it says reason number one is because money is their God. The may, they, they suggested that one of the first reasons why people don't tithe is because money is their God. Money controls them. Money dictates to them. Their life is about money. Getting all that they can get, and it controls. And, and, and life, they, they, if they got money, they're up. If they ain't got no money, they're down. Money kind of determine, you know, their attitude and how they function. Money is their God. The second reason it says is, is because one can't bring themselves to trust God. I, I've heard the teaching. I believe it's true, but I don't have the faith enough to be able to see how I can do that. Where I systematically, from the top or from all of my increase, I can't see my way through, and so it's a lack of faith. Third reason the article suggests is that the person doesn't fear God. They hear his word, they read his word, they, 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 they see it in the scripture, but there's not really a reverence for God or fear that there's any consequences or there's any awe of God to the point where I'm ready to respond to what I hear. Fourthly, the article suggests that some haven't been taught. It's maybe ignorance, the article suggests. They haven't been taught the word of God. But if you've been here any length of time, that's not your story. Amen. Amen. If you just arrived, now we don't preach about money. For those of you that may say, oh, Lord, I went there and they was preaching about money. It's been two years at least since I've preached a tithing series or really just, you know, encourage us. And it's vital. I can't preach the word of God and not touch this. So if you, if you, just, if you, if you just happen to be here today, then maybe that's the, the son that the Lord wanted you to be here. And then the final reason it, it submitted it is that people don't believe that it's a New Testament principle. They believe it's something that's still under the law, not relevant to Christians today, and therefore, I am not obligated. Have, anybody ever heard that? You know, that's Old Testament. That's Old Covenant. And that's no relevance to us today. Would you, would you trust me to say this with me, enough to say this with me, and I'll try to prove this argument today. Say this with me. Giving is not about obligation. Giving is not about obligation. It's not about law. It's not about constraint. It's, not about constraint. it's an act of worship. It's an act of worship. Amen. Amen. Can we say that one more time? Giving is not about obligation. It's not about obligation. It's not about law. It's not about constraint. It's an act of worship. Amen. I know that many of us get turned off when we merely even hear the subject in church about money. The truth of the matter is, is, is most of the preaching that I hear about Money, I get turned off too. I don't. I, I, listen, we, we recently switched from cable to 
DirecTV, and this is not a commercial for DirecTV, but... <laughs> but my cable provider would have only one religious station and a second one, but they look like spend more time um, trying to sell vitamins and different things than <laughs> preaching the gospel. So uh, one of the things in addition to, uh, you know, I was able to have more religious programming. About I counted about 12 stations that are primarily geared toward religious programming. And so from time to time I would turn it on and, and, and but I'm still disappointed because 80% of the program, maybe 85% of them, of the messages that I hear is an appeal for money. And somebody trying to sell you something. Or, you know, you send this and you're going to you know, you're going to get some miracle vial of oil that we done prayed over for 17 days. <laughs> Or you going to get a, a anointed, you know, somebody's wailing over a prayer shawl and, you know, and, and pray and you send X number of dollars and we'll send you and you can wrap yourself up in this shawl and like all of your problems are going to go away. Amen. Or amen, amen, amen. I just had a, a prophetic word. The Lord told me it was Acts 2.38. And the Lord said for the first thousand people that send $238, you call and I'm going to get a, you know, it's like zap all your problems. You know what? You know, and, and they appeal to the issues that you're going to have better health, better wealth, your children. You know, all of a sudden, going to straighten out, and they're going to be acting like baby kids no more. You know, everything just, amen, you're looking for love, you're going to find love. I mean, it's a whole bunch of problems, but it's wrapped up in that $238. <laughs> and until you send that 238 God can't activate nothing. <laughs> and y'all can sing that all y'all want. I'm talking about God favors me. No, he favored me if you send that $238. I get sick of it. Am I the only one? Anybody else, anybody else get tired of that? Amen. God is not the lottery. God is not some gimmick. God is nothing to be played with. And what, what really bothers me most about it is something that is so prevalent in the word of God. And those of us that have been walking through the Bible, reading the scriptures every day, you can't snatch away or deny the fact that, that those who love God honored God and worship God with their offerings and their sacrifices. And the sad thing is when it becomes tainted, by, by charlatans and hypocrites and folks who, 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 who takes and perverts what God says is holy Amen. to the point where people get turned off and they don't want to hear anything and then you could become so desensitized and so turned off until you miss some of what God wants you to hear and to know. Well, listen, this message is not about trying to put you under any constraint, any guilt, any obligation. You know, because if you've heard this message of tithing and giving and sacrificial and you've not been convinced, probably another, you know, me beating you across the head with Malachi 310 probably won't move you today. So I'm not even going there. I want to talk about worship. Amen. And in the fact that giving, giving is not an obligation. It's, n it's not about obligation. It's not about law. It's not about constraint. It's an act of worship. Say it with me again, an act of worship. Act of worship. Father, over these next perhaps, I don't know, 30 minutes or whatever you allow. I hope not to even be that long. Lord, would you, would you speak to us? Would you in would you anoint me to teach?
would you anoint every heart to be open to hear, not the pastor. God, can we, Lord, would you, I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit will, will be so evident in this room today that when we walk out of these doors, the, 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 the reverberations will not be what did pastor say or what did he preach, but may it be said that God talked to us and I heard his voice. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin this morning in the Old Testament. In fact, most of my time today will be just noting a few beginning things. Genesis chapter, and Brother Cornelius, if you will minister, would you help me? And uh, I don't know if you got the notes, amen, and where we going? Amen. Genesis chapter 4, if you will, and in, in verse 3 through 5. While you're finding your place there, uh, the scripture says that Adam knew his wife. Uh, in, in, in other words, he uh, knew in that sense he had sexual relationships with her, and, and she had a son. And when uh, his son was born, his, uh, she named him Cain. Uh, she acknowledged that this birth was of the Lord. In fact, the name Cain means acquisition. He was acquired from the Lord. Now, it's not recorded in the Bible, but somewhere along the lines, there must have been some instructions that if a sinful man, listen to me carefully, if a sinful man approaches God, that man does not approach God without an offering of some sort to please, to offer unto the Lord. So with that, Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, and it reads, And in the process of time, in the process of time, as time moved on, yes, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground, Cain, this first son, brought of the fruit of the ground, an I, offering unto an the Lord. An offering. It, did, it didn't say, uh, now I know that there's been... Uh, Yes, theologians who have suggested that it was because it was a sacrifice without blood that uh, caused his offering to not be acceptable unto the Lord. He brought something that didn't cost any blood. Uh, later on, I noticed the Lord accepted grain offerings. But I don't think, I don't, you know, we can have discussion about whether it was the grain or whether it was some other reason. But... All it says is that he brought the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And what? And Abel. And then Abel. Who was Abel? Abel was his brother. Yes. He also brought of the firstlings of his flock. What's the difference? Abel bought, brought of the firstlings, first fruit of his flock. And of the fat thereof. He, bought, he brought God the very best. It's interesting where... Preceding these verses, there is no commandment that we will read or recorded in Scripture where God required either of them to bring an offering. It seems that both of these offerings were volunteer. It seems that both of these offerings were spontaneous. But the difference was one was brought, one brought an offering, and one brought the first, and he brought the best. And what? And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. The Lord had respect. The Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. Again, there was no universal law to say how much. The, the scripture don't even tell us what type. It, it, it says it was just the first things. It don't tell us how much. But God had respect. In fact, God has so much respect for it. In, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, and you don't, you don't have to turn there, but the scripture there says, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. The writer of the Hebrew called it an excellent sacrifice. And then he went on to say, By which he obtained witness that he was righteous. What an amazing verse, an amazing thought. Where Cain, pardon me, Abel, 
obtain witness from God that he was righteous based on what? Based on his offering. Amen. Based on his offering. God looked at his offering, his righteous offering, and said in God witness that he was righteous. What? God testifying of his gift by it he being dead yet speaking. You know, I, I, I should, you know, I really, just in the interest of time, I know I'm not doing that verse justice, but it's amazing thoughts there. That he was looked upon as righteous based on his offering. Mm. And then the Lord says that even though he's dead, mm -hmm. his offering still speaking. Amen. His act of worship Amen. is still speaking. Mm. And I'm sp still talking about the brother today. Amen. Thousands of years later, because one act that was initiated spontaneous, not by obligation or constraint, but because he worshipped God, and God was pleased with his worship. Can you see that? Abel worshipped God. Let's move. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. Another story. Remember when, when we know the story of Noah, what God says to Noah, it's going to rain. Bill and Ark, all those who... Uh, find themselves, you can find safety and security. Stank up in there. <laughs> can you imagine being hemmed up 40 days plus with a bunch of animals? Glory to God. Can you imagine the stench in there? Amen. Amen. But guess what? It might have been stinking there, but that was the place where God says he was going to spare their life. Uh, Sometimes I look at the church like an ark. Sometimes it might be a stench in here. And I'm not picking on nobody. Oh, y'all catch that tomorrow. Amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. It, it, it may be things that, amen, that, that, that we don't like and appreciate. How, how many of you know there's safety there? Come on, give him a praise, somebody. And when the rains had stopped and the flood water subsided and, and the Lord finally, you know, the, 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 you know, is about to release them and God saved them. Saved them. What was Noah's response? Look at chapter 8, verse 20. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord. In appreciation. Again, this is not law. This is not obligation. Nobody commanding. I don't read anything where God told Noah to give me an offering. But in respond to salvation, in respond to how good God had been to him, the first thing that Noah did when he got out of that ark, the Bible says he built an altar. Yes. And took of every clean beast. He took of every clean beast. And yes. of every clean fowl. Yes. And offered burnt offerings on the altar. And he offered a burnt offering. He offered the Lord an offering. It was spontaneous. It was an act of worship. It was an act of appreciation. It wasn't, it wasn't twisting an arm. But I'm doing this because you love it. And then how did God respond? And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. God smelled that offering because he knew that it came from a heart. That offering sent up to God an aroma, a sweet savor. A sweet smell. Yes. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. God was so moved by that savor. He said that I will no longer curse the ground anymore. For anymore man's regardless sake. of how much man sin. Yes. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Do you agree with me that we live in an evil society? But do you not know it was after Noah's offering and his sacrifice to God that God said, you know what? Wickedness may prevail in the land, but I will spare the land. Now, now, we can have an argument about, or discussion about, if you will, whether it was an offering that moved God, but all I know is, is as I read and understand the scripture, it was after, 
after God was pleased with this man's offering, that God covered and protected them. And I believe, listen, 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 God, listen, we done had some floodwaters and some uh, tsunamis and some hurricanes and some severe weather, but we have not experienced another time where God has, amen, destroyed the whole earth because of the wickedness of man. It is not because there's not wickedness that prevail in this land. Amen. Yes, and God said what? While the earth remained. While the earth remained. Seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Amen. We are still experiencing the grace of God. Noah responded to God's saving grace by building an altar and offering an altar. Now, the first mention of tithe, the first time we see that in the Bible, uh, Elder Patrick actually covered last week. We see it in, 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 in Genesis chapter 14. Let's take another quick, quick look there. Genesis chapter 14. You remember this story where uh, Lot had been uh, captured and, and, and in captivity and Abraham uh, decided that he would go down. He took 318 men, going to go down to rescue his uh, uh, nephew Lot, uh, knowing perhaps that we don't have the ability of ourselves to have victory over five kings. Amen. But they went down there and God gave them the victory. God gave Abraham with his 318 men the victory over five kings and their armies. And so, not only did he give them victory, but he gave them the spoil and enriched Abraham. Oh, my God. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. Now, he's returning, and then when you get to chapter, uh, verse 17, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him mm -hmm. after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer, Abraham is returning from the slaughter with all of this wealth. <laughs> Amen. And 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 and, and uh, the king of Sodom went out to meet him. Yes. And of the kings that were with him. And all the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva. Yes. Which is the king's dale. In the king's valley. Yes. And Melchizedek, king of Salem. Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Who is this? Melchizedek, he's the king of Salem, which Salem was an uh, 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 early name or uh, is believed to be uh, an earlier name for the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And the history will bear that out. Amen. He is what? The king of Salem? Yes. Brought forth bread and wine. He, he brings forth bread and wine, which, you know, points to, um, you know, he's a king, but then he's bringing forth bread and wine with brought forth, uh, pointing to the Lord, the, 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 the communion or the sacrifice, if you will. Yes. And he was the priest of the Most High God. He's a king of Salem, which means that he's the king of righteousness. Right. Well, first of all, his, his name, Melchizedek, meant king of righteousness. And then he's the king of Salem, and Salem meant peace. So he's the king of righteousness and, and peace, but then he is also the priest of the Most High. He's royal, and he's priest. Now, priest, a priest was one. Priest really, a priest was a bridge. A priest meant, it's is just one who becomes a bridge between the people and God. And, but he wasn't a priest after the order of Aaron or the normal priesthood where you had to be born into a certain tribe and you, and, and you became eligible to become a priest at age 30 through uh, age 50. And then or you had to go through and you, 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 it had to be verified that you had a certain lineage in order to be called a priest. Not this Melchizedek. He was a different priest. He says he was a priest of the Most High God. In other words, he was representative of all of the program and the people of God. Yes. And he blessed him. And a this Melchizedek did what? Blessed Abraham. And again, uh, no, I'm not doing justice, but, 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 but earlier God had already pronounced and promised Abraham that he was going to be the father of many nations. 
that he was going to bless his seed. But then, why was it necessary to have a priest come along and then bless what God done already promised? If God done promised, why well, need a blessing? The priest, the, the promise of God was sure. And God will do what he say, but it looked like the priest come along and began to bless or speak into his life what God had promised. And he said he blessed Abraham saying what? Blessed be Abram of the most high God. Blessed be Abram of the most high God. Possessor of heaven and earth. Possessor of heaven and earth. It looked like the priest pronounced or set in motion what God had promised in the life of Abraham. Oh, Amen. He blessed them. And then how did Abraham respond? And blessed be the most high God which hath delivered thine enemies. It's the most high God who has delivered your enemies. Yes. Into thy hands. Into thy hands. And he gave him tithes of all. He gave uh -huh. him tithes of all. Now, Melchizedek blesses Abraham. And then Abraham responds by saying, I'm going to give a tenth of all. Now, when you go to Hebrews chapter 7, it said there, uh, chapter 7, verse 2, he gave him a tenth of the spoil. And the word that is there um, is, is acronym, which means, acro means um, the top heap. He gave him the top of the heap. Abraham when, 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 when he's got all this spoil, all these goods, and when the priest blessed him, he didn't just pinch him and say, okay, let me find, I think I'll give you that goat there. Uh, let me find another piece of, piece of silver here. I'll give you this, and you can have this, and maybe you can have that. No, the Bible said he, when, 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 when Melchizedek blessed him, he gave, he gave him, he says, I'm going to give you the top of the heap. I'm going to give you of the best portion. Now, who told him to do that? There's several questions that I asked. I said, there's no law. The law of Moses didn't come to almost 500 years later. How did he come up in his mind with this percentage of a tenth? What's a, what was significant about a tenth? Tenth is just a number, isn't it? I want to submit that t a tenth, a tenth, how many of you know ten is significant that it mean, means completion? Tenth means whole. We, we still have that numbering system now. We count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we get the ten, we, we go back to what? One, again, you know, another denomination. 11, 12, 13, and we go to 20, and then we start over. We don't just go 9 and then something else, because 10 means whole, which 10 means is a representing part of a whole. So when Abraham decided, decided I'm going to worship, I'm going to honor Melchizedek with the 10th, he's saying a couple of things. Number one, he's saying, I recognize your priesthood, and I recognize that the better blesses the one who is less. The one who is less is blessed by the better. And even though God told him that you're going to be the father of all or many nations, because you have pronounced blessings on me, I understand that your priesthood is greater than my posterity. And so you spoke blessings into my life. And so I, in turn, volunteered, not by obligation, not by constraint. I want to bless you back. By, I want to honor you, let me say, by giving you the top of the heap. Oh, amen. Amen, somebody. Now, what's the significance of Abraham? Now, now Melchizedek, let me just talk about him for just another moment. Um, um, a, a lot of uh, um, people believe um, uh, believe that Melchizedek could have been a, um, a, 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 a Christophany, which is a pre-incarnate 
uh, appearance of Jesus. Now, there are several Christophanies in the Bible. Amen. Uh, Christophanies where, you remember when, when those Hebrew boys uh, were thrown in the fire of and, and And the king threw in three. And, and then he looked in there and there was a fourth one. And saying, did not I throw in three, but then there's a fourth one, and the fourth one looked like the Son of God. That's a Christophany, right. where, where there's a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. Yeah. Now, some folks try to make Melchizedek a Christophany, but I would rather believe that he's a type of Christ. Because even though the Bible says he didn't have beginning of days nor end of life, he didn't have father and mother and all of that, he was a type. Because a thousand years later, in Psalms 110 and 4, the psalmist say, thou art, he's, he's talking about Jesus. He says, thou art a priest forever Amen. after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. A thousand years later. In other words, the, 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 the psalmist that saw Jesus said, Melchizedek was a type of Christ. And then you go another thousand years when the uh, writer of the Hebrews come along and, 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 and it said several places in the book of Hebrews, thou art a priest, talking about the priesthood of Jesus, thou art a priest for order uh, forever after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, this is a priesthood that lasts forever. The priesthood of our Lord Jesus is an eternal priesthood. And then he said, here men receive tithe, but he said, but there he received tithe forever. Amen. Oh, my God. Oh, amen, somebody. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying Abraham recognized that this is the greater priesthood. And so I will give the top of the heat in honor, not because of obligation, but because, because he's worthy of it. Now, uh, let me, I, I said I didn't want to be long. Give me a few more minutes. Listen, 500 years later almost, then you have the incorporation of uh, tithe in the Mosaic law. But when you look at that, there was at least three tithes. And, 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 and three different tithes. One of 10% that went to the Levites and another was a, 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 another 10% uh, that went to the, uh, you know, for the order of the temple and all. And then there was every three years a third tithe that was given every three years that was basically for the welfare of the nation. So you had tithing under the law was really about 23%. It wasn't just 10%. Ooh. I say, aren't you glad we're not under the law? <laughs> amen, amen. It was about 23%. But you know what? Tithing under the law was really not just work. It, it was more of a taxation. A system in which God had ordained to take care of the temple and the priests and the people and, and the widows and the poor and all of that. And the Lord said, it belongs to me. And if you don't bring it, he said, you're robbing me. But now even under the law, God didn't want, even though there was certain, can I call it taxation? There was obligatory giving under the law. But God didn't want them to get stuck there. He still wanted them to have free will giving or to give not because of obligation, not because of law, but because you love me Amen. and because you worship me. And those of us that have been reading the scripture, you saw in the book of Numbers how the law says, he says to Moses, tell them to bring me an offering. And then he qualifies. He says, but all of them that do it of a free heart and do it willingly. In other words, God says, I want whatever you do for me, I want you to do it for because you love me. Not because I'm twisting your arm. And the Bible says, you know what, when they begin to bring the offerings for the temple, the people begin to bring so much money, so much stuff, until they had more than enough. And Moses had to send a, a decree out to say, listen, because he says those people were bringing uh, offerings every morning. Moses sent out a word, and he said, please tell the people, all the men, all the women, stop. Do not bring no more offerings. 
because we have more than enough. Anybody ever heard a preacher stand up and say, stop? Please. Y'all don't bring no more tithes, no more offerings. We can't count it fast enough. We don't know what to do with all of what you all are bringing. Let me tell you something. That's what happened. That's what happened in that day. But now listen. God was always concerned about their heart. I want you to go to uh, the opening passage of scripture for the day. A few verses there. Malachi chapter 1. God has been concerned about people's heart. Here's what I'm trying to get to. Malachi 1 and 6. A son honoreth his father. People, Israel had been in captivity for about 70 years, and God had delivered them, and then they had come back, and, and um, the temple had been rebuilt, and on the outside, look, everything was in order. Except God knew that they were going through the motion, and they were, they were bringing offerings, they were giving, and it looked like all was well and lovely and hunky-dory. It looked like everything was fine. But God was looking past that and say, you know what? I'm concerned about your heart and the attitude. And I want to tell you something. One of the saddest things is to be bringing the Lord an offering or giving a tithe or giving anything to the Lord and you mad. <laughs> Are you doing it because you just feel obligated? You're doing it because you want to be seen. You're doing it because you're thinking that, well, if, if, if I don't give this, you know, somebody going to look down on me. That's a poor reason to stand up or to honor the Lord or to bring the Lord a tithe or to bring the Lord an offering. Well, they don't, they're not going to let me serve or they don't, they're not going to let me do this. Or they don't. That's why I bring the Lord an offering so I can stay in good keeping. Listen, listen, ain't nobody going to kick you out the church if you don't give the Lord an offering. Nobody going to look bad and beat you up. You know what? That's your bad. And the Lord, see, and what has started happening in the book of Malachi is you had a lot of people that had started, they, they were giving God something, but it was polluted because it really wasn't from their heart. They were more concerned about how they were seen of others, and, and, and I'm doing just enough to get by to say, I done done mine. Amen. And God said, you know what? That ain't it. He says what? In, in verse 6. A son honoreth his father. God asked them a question. A son honoreth his father. Yes. And a servant his master. A good servant honors his master. If then I be a father. If I'm your father. Where is my If honor? I'm your father and I'm your God and I've been good to you and I've saved your soul and healed your body and covered your family and brought you out of sin. If I've done all of this and, and, and you were lost on your way to hell and I'm your father, you are relying upon me to take you to heaven and the glory. You're relying upon me to be your supply and to meet all your needs. And you wave your hands and you worship me and you say... Our Father who art in heaven. God says, if I'm your Father, where is mine honor? Then where is my honor? Amen. Why, where? Where is my honor? And somebody said, well, I honor you, Lord. Didn't you hear me say when we, we had testimony services? Well, I give honor to the Spirit of Christ. <laughs> well, I honor the Lord today. Lord, I love you. No, the Lord said, no, I ain't, I ain't talking about your word. God says, if I'm your father, where is my honor? Yes. And if I be a master, where is my fear? If, 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 if I'm your master, why do you not awe me? Why do you not respect my word? Yes. Saith the Lord of hosts. Saith the Lord of hosts. Unto you, O priests that despise my name. Not only were the people, but the priest too was despising the name of the Lord. Yes. And you say, wherein have we despised that? They had the audacity to even argue back with God. Say, God, we don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> how, how do you say we despise your name? I mean, you see me giving you worship and praise every Sunday. You see me serving. You see me doing all that. And Lord say, you know what? I see what you're doing, but you're despising my name. Yes. You offer polluted bread. God said, here's how you despise my name. Because you offer polluted bread. You offer me bread, but it's polluted. Because it's not the first. It's not from your heart. It's not an act of worship. And if you bring it because you just because it's constraint, if it's because it's obligation, then it's polluted. 
Why is it necessary? Somebody might be sitting there and say, well, Pastor, I've been giving my tithe. I want to submit to you. I don't want anyone in this church to give a tenth and it's polluted. And it can become polluted if you're doing it to be seen or if you're doing it for obligation or if you're doing it because it's just something. You feel like it's just the law. There's no worship in it. We're just doing it. And God said, listen, that's not honoring me. And I'm going to tell you something. We do not need your money that bad. Somebody might say, oh, Lord, Pastor. Because listen, listen, listen. If you're not not doing it because you honor God, you're not being blessed. And God's still saying it's polluted. God ain't saying, God said, I don't need you to be pinching me off a little nibble here and there. Try to keep the church open. God says, I want some people who honor me and, and do what they do because they love me, not because they, glory to God, they think somebody's looking at their tithing record. Nobody even worrying about your record. That's between you and God. Yes. You offer polluted bread upon mine altar. The Lord said, here's the problem I have with you. You're offering polluted bread. You're offering it, but it's polluted. Yes. And you say, wherein have we polluted thee? You say, where have we polluted it? In that you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. You say, it's really, it really not that serious. It's contemptible. You, you, yes. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? I mean, you, you offering something, but you know what? You ain't giving me your best. You're not giving me the first. You're looking upon, uh, you know, uh, in, in your herd, you're trying to pick out them goats and sheep and calves that spotted and blind. You know what? You know, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know you got a blue ribbon cow that, that done won the award at the market. Oh, come on, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the cow show. But you ain't bringing that cow. <laughs> Now, I'm going to keep that blue ribbon cow back here, but let me see if I can find one. I want one that the eyes don't be, I want one scarred up with the eyes punched out, and I'll bring that to, come on, amen, one that's limping and maimed. Come on, a lot of the hair done been burnt off of him. Amen. That one that I know I can't really sell at the market, and I'll take that to the house of the Lord. Come on. That, I'll take that to the house of the Lord and say, here, God, I love you, Lord. This is what's left. This, 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 what I can, this ain't going to hurt me too bad. I can afford to get, get rid of this one because he wasn't going to bring me much no way. Yes. And if you offer the lame and sick. You're offering them the lame one. Amen. Amen. The cow limping. Take him to God. God, come on. Amen. You offer me the lame and the sick. Is it not evil? God said, isn't that a mess? Isn't that evil? He said, listen. That's wicked. You're not honoring me. If, if, if you're bringing me an offering, you're saying, God, this is what I feel like I can do without this week. I think I can, I think I, I think I can give you this 20 and it ain't going to hurt me and it ain't going to keep me from, you know, um, you know, getting what I need to get done. Amen. I got, I got things to do at the school. I got things to do at home. I got bills to pay. I want to take a trip. Amen. We want to be having a crab party this weekend. And, and, uh, and um, amen. And, um, yeah, I, I, w- I would give 50, but I think them crabs, they, they not on sale this week. <laughs> So, so here is what I can bring you that won't interrupt what I got to do. And I bring it to God. Not, not, not you, my father, but this is what I got for you. Yes. Offer it now unto thy governor. He said, listen, God says, you know what? Why don't you try that with Rick Scott? Why, why, don't, why, don't you, why don't you say 
to Rick or to the to, to the governor, the president, you know what? I ain't paying no taxes. I'm going to give y'all what I want you to have. Go ahead. You so bad, I mean, you feel like you know you got it all. You decide what you're going to do and what you're going to do. You'll get by a while, but I guarantee you they coming after you after a while. That's Wesley. That was not nice, Pastor. That was not nice. That was not nice. Listen, you can't offer the government anything. They're going to get theirs. In fact, because they don't trust you, they take theirs before you, they, before you get yours. And we don't complain about that. We, we might complain, but we don't fuss. You know, and, and, and because it's obligation, we know that's got to be done. Well, now when it come to God, God, I mean, you, 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 know, you get what I bring you. You get what's left. Amen. Amen. Somebody said, well, I honor Pope God. Yeah, I, I got to quit. You say, well, I honor God. I honor God. I honor God. I, I serve him. I, I speak well of him. I do a whole lot of wonderful, nice things. Proverbs 3 and 9. And I, I got I to quit. Yeah. Honor the Lord with thy substance. Here's what, here's what the writer said. Listen. God need more than your talk. Money is a, 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 a spiritual barometer. And I don't care how much singing and shouting and preaching and praising and whatever you do. When I read from the beginning of this book to the end of the book, the standard has always been honor the Lord with your system. I can't worship God without what he trusts me with. It's just something right about intrinsically giving that. And it wasn't obligation. It wasn't law. It wasn't constraint. It's always been about honor. It's always been voluntarily, spontaneous. It's been like an acknowledgement that God, you are the source of all that I have. And because you have been good to me, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to worship you with my substance. Yes. And with the first fruits of all thine increase. With the first fruit, beginning of all my increase. God, every bit of increase that comes into my life, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to honor you with the first fruit of all my increase. It's an act of worship. When I prepare, my wife and I, we prepare an envelope every Sunday. And I don't get paid every week. But I don't know, Lord. I, I, I heard, I, 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 I believe there's just something right about every time I come to worship the Lord. I want to worship him with my lips. I want to worship him with my praise. I want to worship him. But in this envelope is a part of my worship. A part of my worship, a part of my adoration is in this envelope. A part of my appreciation to God. Not only that, but a part of my life is in here. A part of me is in this envelope. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about that when God brings increase into my life, well, sometimes that increases as a result of work that has been done. It's, 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 it's something that God has given me the wisdom or the ability or brought some kind of favor into my life as in response to maybe something that I've done. If, if you go on your job and you work 40 hours during a week and then you're bringing God up and then you get paid so much an hour for that 40 hours a week. That 40 hours a week of that, that currency that you're paid, people are paying you for your time, your skill, your labor, your ability. And a part of your pay is your life. And when you take a part of your life and your income and you put it in an envelope and you bring it to God and you offer it up to God, you're saying, God, part of me is in here. My time is in here. My life is in here. 
My ingenuity is in here. And I'm offering that back up to you, not because of obligation, not because of law, not to impress anybody. It ain't nobody's business. But I do it because I love you. Oh, amen, somebody. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The psalmist said, give unto the Lord, oh, ye kindred of people. Give unto the Lord the glory, glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory that is due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. and Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come on, will you stand with me? I, in, in, in closing, there's one other thought that I had that we know the story of this woman who had the, the Bible says in Mark chapter 14, it talked about a Simon the leper had a dinner. Let me, let me just give it to you in my own words. Simon the leper he had a dinner or a party, if you will, in his house. And it's interesting that he had to have already been cleansed from leprosy. Otherwise, the law would not have allowed him to be entertaining guests. So he's been delivered from leprosy. But it's interesting how Mark says Simon the leper let me say Simon used to be a leper. He had a reputation of a leper. But he wasn't a leper anymore. You know how people do. Sometimes folks remember us for who we was. They look at us for who we used to be. But you ought to touch somebody and say, I'm not who I used to be. The Bible says that Jesus was in the house at a dinner of Simon the leper. Maybe Simon was even hosting this dinner in appreciation of the fact that God done delivered me and brought me out of what I was in. <laughs> Glory to God. Perhaps that's why he was the host. But there was a woman there at the party. The Bible says she had an alabaster box. Oh my God. A precious perfume. And this woman, somebody think that she might have been married. I don't know that to be fact, but if it was, whoever she was, this woman was there because she loved Jesus. She took what was precious. Glory to God. This precious ointment or oil, the Bible said, and she broke it open and began to pour it over the head of the Lord Jesus. But then John said, not only did she pour it over his head, but even over his feet. Took her hair and wiped her feet and his head with her hair. My God Almighty. And I can look at people around, people around the looking startled, saying that's unbelievable. Does she know how much that cost? The Bible said it was worth 300 denario, which represented about a year's salary. Why would anybody in their right mind take a year's salary and pour it out at one time on the head of, of anybody and their feet and massage and, and perfume? their feet. Why would anybody do it? Why would anybody do that? Jesus didn't tell her to do that. Jesus didn't obligate her to do that. She did it because she loved it. She did it because she understood that the Lord done brought me through so much. And there is nothing too much that I can do for my Lord and my Savior. And you know what? It wasn't nobody there man but the devil. It was old Judas. Come on, the pragmatic one. I can't understand why y'all taking all y'all money down there to the church. 
I can't tell, I can't understand why y'all giving all your money to your priest. I can't understand nobody that will give all something that's worth the entire year's salary and pour it out on Jesus. On Jesus, Judah said we could have used that to feed the poor. He wasn't concerned about the poor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Do you love him? Do you love the Lord Jesus? And I want to just say to this church, I appreciate all of you here. My prayer is this. We, we prayed. We've prayed. We prayed during those 10 days of prayer that, Lord, we want our church to be 100% tithing church. But, you know, I've, I've kind of, i, I got to tell you, I've kind of altered my prayer a bit. I don't, I, don't, I don't want people giving by obligation or constraint or mad or for any other reason. But I'm praying that God will begin to fall in love with you so much until it's not even about the 10 percent. 10 percent is not a limit. God, would you, give, would you bring us to a place where, 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 where we love you so much? Glory to God. That we are so sensitive to your spirit that whatever you tell us to do, we are ready to obey. Whatever you do. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share with these, your precious people. Lord, I, I, Lord Jesus, during this week, all week long, Lord, I've searched my own heart. And Father, though I've been a systematic tither and I've been a giver, Lord, if there's any time that I've given an offering, uh, given a broader type, uh, made a sacrifice with an attitude that was not pleasing to you, I ask your forgiveness. If there's any time that I've given with a motive that hasn't been pure, if I've ever given anything that 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 then and offered something to you that and called it my best, knowing in my heart it really wasn't, I ask your forgiveness. Would you bring this church, this house, to a place where we understand that it's all about honoring and worshiping you? Help us not to get stuck on the amount. Help us not to get stuck on how, any other reason, but, but every time, every time we come in your presence, we want to worship you with our lips, our hands, and our substance. I pray, oh God, that that permeate the heart and the mind of this congregation, not only us, but even our children. May we pass it on, that they too will learn how to worship you and honor you with the first. And God, we know that in doing so, you'll be blessed. We'll be blessed. You'll be glorified. And Father, we know that the, 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 the ministry of Jesus Christ will be fulfilled in all that you call us to do. Thank you now. Thank you for this opportunity to share in Jesus' name. Now, we every head yet bowed. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe there's somebody in this room that you're not saved. Maybe you're backslidden. Maybe you're not where you ought to be in God. Maybe areas of your life. Or maybe there's just some reason you need special prayer for some other reason. And you desire to come for special prayer. I want to ask you to just start walking now. If there's anything that you need from God, we'll pray with you today. And we're going to believe God with you. Are there any? Thank you, Jesus. Are there any? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. I surrender all to you. Everything I give to you. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing withholding nothing withholding nothing
me I surrender all Everything I give Withholding Withholding nothing Withholding nothing Withholding nothing Withholding nothing Withholding Here's here's what I, I feel led to do this a little bit different. Um, first, let me say to our visitors, you don't have to give an offering. You don't have to participate. But I'm going to ask every member of this church, everyone that can, everyone that will, to get something in your hands. Maybe it's not the day that you normally tithe. Maybe you tithe last week or paid it online. But if, 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 if it's a dollar, if it's a whatever you can, I want everyone that will get something in your hand. If it's a quarter, if you got a bar or a dime, I'm, I want everybody to get something in your hand. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Y'all know I don't, I, don't, I don't do this. And again, to visitors, you don't have to, you don't have to participate. But I, need, I want everyone to get, I just want us to worship the Lord. And bring the Lord an offering today. I want the, I want you to bring. I want all the children. If anybody need to borrow a, a dollar or five dollars or whatever, I'll I'll lend you some money if you, if I have to. I don't even have a wallet. I'm talking. I ain't get a wallet. I, I need everybody to get something in your hand. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Amen. Amen. I I I want us to. I want us to. Y'all know that and I'm not a pastor that manipulate people over money. And normally the deacons, but I, I just I want us to I want us to just bring the Lord something today. As an act of worship. We pray week after week. Father, I thank you for bringing the increase to my life. All that we have belong to you as an act of worship. In obedience to your word, we bring to you. Whatever you bring today, I want you to bring it as an act of worship. Minister, would you get me that basket? Amen. Amen. Uh, okay, I, I, I was looking for my deacon. Come on, Deacon McWhite. Amen. Deacon Early, would y'all would y'all come on? Amen. 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 Again, no pressure. Visitors, please don't I, I don't want I, I I want you to I just need one. Let me let me get it all. Amen. I, I, uh, I'm serious. I need to lend anybody any money today. Amen. Uh, give anybody any money. Come, I'll give you something to put in if you ain't got nothing to put in. I want you to get something in your hand. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. They say, boy, they must be desperate for money. No, 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 no. But if, if, you, if God's been good to you, if you know his worth and you want to express that, we've worshipped him already today with our songs and our clapping and our adoration. And I want you to get that seed in your hand. I want you to get that part of you, that, that part of your substance, that part of your life. And get it in your hand. And Father, I want to pray that you bless, bless us now. Bless us now. Teach us, Lord. Teach us, Lord. Teach us, Lord. That this is not obligation. This is not constraint. This is not manipulation. But this is our life. This is our praise. This is our worship. This is our worship. This is our appreciation. This is our awe and our reverence for you. And we bring our tithes, our offerings, our gifts, our sacrifices, whatever we're bringing. We're bringing it now. And I pray for that one that have the desire to give, that one that had the borrow. I pray that not that because they want to worship you, you promise to put seeds into the hands of the sower. And because they're in obedience, sowing today, worshiping you today, I'm asking that this, I'm, I'm asking you, God, that would you supernaturally bring increase into their lives? 
in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Bless right now. Bless right now. Every offering, every tithe, everything that is given, I'm going to ask that you bless it in a mighty, special way today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, would you just, those of you that are inclined to honor the Lord with your substance, would you bring it down? God bless you.